versus all of us being able to have class together. I hope you guys are well and that your shelter in place or quarantine, as I've heard some people call it, is going acceptably well. I miss you guys. I look forward to being able to get together again in person soon. If you want to start a spirited conversation among NBA fans, start talking about who the best basketball player of all time is. Some will say it's the late Kobe Bryant, others LeBron James, or Michael Jordan. Not saying he's definitively the best, but let's use Michael as an example. Michael Jordan's career shooting percentage was 49.7%, just shy of making one out of every two shots. There are other similar preeminent athletes in other sports. In Major League Baseball, Ty Cobb holds the highest career batting average of 366 over 24 seasons. In the NFL, Drew Brees of the New Orleans Saints holds the highest career passing percentage at 67%. All of these people spent countless hours of practice to be the best at what they do. They were or are at the absolute peak of their professions, the best of the best. But you know what? Michael Jordan didn't make every basket. Ty Cobb didn't hit every pitch. And Drew Brees doesn't complete every pass. Why? Because nobody's perfect, not even these preeminent athletes. And what's true in sports is true in the rest of our life including our spiritual life. But the thing is, God's standard is perfection, and none of us can possibly hope to reach that standard. That's a problem, and that's what makes Jesus' work on the cross so important. Writing to Jews and Gentiles in the church at Rome, Paul addressed their equal liability before God. As we studied last week, the opening sections of the epistle maintain the Gentiles' accountability, even if they didn't have the advantage of knowing the scriptures. Nature itself declared the majestic righteousness of its creator. Therefore, even pagans were answerable to the Lord. In today's lesson, Paul's going to tell the Jews that they cannot assert spiritual superiority. Yes, they had a covenant relationship with God, but if they did not keep the conditions of the covenant, they would fall under God's judgment. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. The King James translation starts this verse, quote, Behold, thou art called a Jew. Paul has spent the previous verses stating the general principles on which God would judge the world. He showed how these principles condemn the Gentiles. Now he proceeds to show how these same principles apply to the Jews. He uses the word behold to call their attention to this important topic. The ESV translation says, quote, you call yourself a Jew. Jew. This was the name by which the Hebrews were called at the time Paul was writing this letter, and it's clear that they regarded it as a name of honor. Galatians chapter 2 verse 15 says, We ourselves are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. The origin of the title Jew isn't completely clear. Generally, they were called the children of Israel until the time of Rehoboam the successor to Solomon and a grandson of David. Rehoboam was originally king of all Israel, but the ten northern tribes rebelled, and Rehoboam became the first king of the kingdom of Judah. When the ten tribes were carried into captivity, only two were made, tribes of Judah and Benjamin. The name Jews was evidently given to the, denote those of the tribe of Judah. We're not really sure why the name of Benjamin was lost within that of Judah, but it could be because the tribe of Benjamin was small and comparatively without influence. It could also be because the Messiah was to be from the tribe of Judah, and that increased their influence. The Israelites that remained in Palestine who returned to it after captivity seem to have henceforth been called Jew. The verse says that the Jews, quote, rely on the law. 
The word here is evidently used in the sense of trusting or leaning upon the law. The Jews leaned on or relied on the law for acceptance or favor. They would rely on the law to validate their unique position with God. Moses' law had been given to define God's standards for his people and draw people to realize their need for his mercy. Instead, the Jews had distorted it into a point of pride. Verse 17 says the Jews of Rome, quote, boast in God. In other words, they would boast of their covenant relationship with God, all the while transgressing his law, which they claimed as their own. Paul is pointing out the hypocrisy of calling yourself a Jew but not living according to God's covenant. His argument was that since they claim certain spiritual distinctions, they should live accordingly. The Jews were carved out of history to be God's unique people. Unfortunately, some did not merely feel blessed to have this special relationship with the Lord. They went further and boasted a sense of superiority over others. Verses 19 and 20. And if you are sure that you're your, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Paul repeats his conditional introduction with the word if. He continues to list qualities that some Jews had claimed. Paul says, quote, if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, if they were convinced that God had chosen them to be a guide to the blind, then they should be walking rightly before him. The fact that they considered anyone who was not a Jew to be blind highlighted their self-righteousness. The verse says, quote, a light to those who are in darkness. Jews believed Gentiles were unable to see the truth of God because they weren't part of God's chosen people. Here again, the term Gentiles means anyone except the Jews. They thought Gentiles lived in darkness, a term sometimes used to describe either sin or spiritual ignorance. And to a degree, they were right. The other nations lacked a proper understanding of God. That's why God intended for Israel to testify about him to the rest of the world. Instead of remaining true to God's purpose, the Jews saw their role in a self-serving way. Their hypocrisy prevented them fulfilling God's intention. Their light had become darkness, much as Jesus had warned in the sixth chapter of Matthew. Verse 23 says, If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. As Paul continued citing things that the Jews boasted about, the outrageous nature of their pride became even more exaggerated. The verse says, quote, An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children. The Jews viewed others as foolish and childlike, needing an instructor and teacher. The word translated foolish went further than just a lack of knowledge. It meant unintelligent, without understanding, stupid, and senseless. Similarly, the word, the word children, or babes, as the King James Version says, describes someone who's an infant, a simple-minded person. Both phrases revealed the Jews' conceit. They believed they were in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, but they had missed the point. They fully understood the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law had escaped them. They arrogantly and incorrectly viewed themselves as prime examples of people who were masters of the law. Verses 21 and 22. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Having described a number of what should have been positive qualities, Paul makes his point. If they were such exemplary people that could teach others, perhaps in reality, they needed to teach themselves. In the previous section, Paul had used a series of conditional phrases to establish the qualities the Jews had claimed. Now Paul switches to several rhetorical questions built on the previous statements. The verse says, quote, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? Like the questions that follow, Paul isn't necessarily accusing them of actually stealing. His point was to challenge to whether or not they're being consistent between what they advocated and what they practiced. 
The verse says, quote, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Again, Paul was not saying they were involved in immoral behavior, but rather was demanding that people who expected marital fidelity in others ought to be faithful in their own marriages. The verse continues, quote, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? There's some disagreement between commentators about the meaning of this question. Some scholars suggest that it, since idols represented false gods, some Jews would not have considered it to be stealing if they robbed these temples of deceitful worship. And there's some scriptural support for that interpretation. When Paul was brought before the town clerk in Ephesus for disrespecting the goddess Artemis, the clerk quieted the crowd and said, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. The town clerk defended Paul and the other Christians against the mob's fury by declaring that they were not blasphemers, which some have interpreted to mean plunderers of temples. The implication being that the Jews had the reputation of doing just that. But other scholars think that this was a reference to withholding gifts or offerings from the temple, withholding tithes from the priest, or embezzlement of the temple revenues. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. There's also an account from the Roman Jewish scholar Josephus that supports this idea. According to this account, certain Jews are said to have stolen valuables and gold, which had been given to them for the temple at Jerusalem by Fulvia, a recent convert of theirs at Rome. Fulvia wasn't just anyone. Over the years, she was married to three very powerful men in Rome, including Mark Antony. The story goes that when Emperor Tiberius was informed of the transaction by Fulvia's husband, Tiberius had all Jews banished from Rome. Regardless of which interpretation you prefer, it's clear that the Jews said one thing and did something completely different. In modern day, we might say that they talked the talk, but didn't walk the walk. When I was a kid and completely enamored with fast cars, if we saw a really cool looking car, but it turned out to be slow, we'd say, eh, all show and no go. And here in Texas, we have another saying, all hat, no cattle. Verse 23, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul's statement in verse 23 could be seen as a summation of the earlier rhetorical questions. Quote, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. These Jews seemed to boast in the law. They were proud that they had been entrusted with God's word. They believed that the Mosaic law set them apart as God's chosen people. But instead of treating the law as God's standard by which they should gauge their conduct, they had used it as a symbol of spiritual dominance over others. Paul questioned whether, having elevated the place of the law, they were at the same time dishonoring God by breaking the law. John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If the Jews in the Roman church loved God, they should be diligent to obey his commandments. Their self-proclaimed identity as God's people caused others to associate God's character with the behavior of Israel. Their disobedience affected God's reputation. They brought dishonor to the name of the Lord. The verse continues, quote, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul made his point by referring back to the very scripture in which the Jews had boasted. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23 says, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. The word blaspheme comes from a word meaning to revile. In Old Testament days, Israel and Judah had engaged in flagrant sin. As a result, their actions gave the pagan nations reason to ridicule their God. The prophets condemned Israel and Judah for their behavior because it profaned God's name. 
By the same token, if the Jews of Paul's day were not living in a manner consistent with the scripture in which they boasted, the Gentiles not only would mock them, but they would also disparage Israel's God. Paul concludes his statement with the phrase, because of you. He's figuratively pointing an accusing finger clearly at the Jews' hypocrisy. The Jews in the Roman church only, only are not the only ones that live differently than their professed beliefs, are they? In our lives today, we, we can't lay claim to righteousness if we can't maintain the same standards we require of others. If we're going to talk the talk, we've got to walk the walk. Romans 2, verses 25 through 27. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code in circumcision, but break the law. As we've already said, the Jews were proud of their religious heritage, and part of that heritage was the practice of circumcision. To them, circumcision was more than just a ritual. It identified them as part of God's covenant people. Unfortunately, it was also a source of spiritual vanity. Paul's rebuke in these verses was not intended to condemn the right of circumcision, but rather to put it within the proper context. Circumcision indeed is of value to someone if that person observes the law, but God's covenant wasn't and isn't limited to people who underwent the physical act of circumcision. Circumcision was to represent an inner allegiance to God. If on the other hand, a person breaks the law, Paul is saying that it wouldn't matter if the person was circumcised or not. For these Jews that are not following God's law, even circumcision, which they found great pride in, had become worthless, as if they were uncircumcised. Paul's real emphasis in this section involves obedience to God. The Jews in the church at Rome were bragging about their knowledge of the law, and they considered the sign of circumcision as evidence of their devotion to God. The only problem was they weren't living according to the law. Verse 27 says, Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written, who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Paul contrasts those that are circumcised but don't follow the law with someone who has not been physically circumcised but keeps the law and follows God. He says that this obedience would be regarded as circumcision. Obviously, this is metaphorical and not discussing physical circumcision. Paul is stressing that it's not whether or not people are circumcised, but whether or not they are obedient to the Lord. In verse 26, Paul argues that the uncircumcised person who kept the law was preferred to someone who was circumcised, but did not obey. In verse 27, Paul further elevates the person who is physically uncircumcised, but who keeps the law. He says that such a person would be in a position to judge someone who is breaking God's law even if the latter had followed the letter of the law, the verse says written code, and experienced circumcision. God wants us to obey him with all our hearts rather than following the letter of the law. Romans chapter 7 verse 6 says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Paul considered himself to be a minister of the new covenant, focusing not on the letter of the law, but on the spirit of God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, Who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit? For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Paul continues to discuss obedience versus physical attributes. Uh, verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Within the church at Rome, a growing schism had appeared between Jewish and Gentile believers. Evidently, unlike the Judaizers of the church at Galatia, the Jews of the church of Rome did not insist that the Gentile Christians adopt Je Jewish rituals, but their air su uh, spiritual superiority created friction in the fellowship. <clears throat> 
It was like the Jews considered the Gentiles to be second-tier Christians. Paul took an unusual approach to correct their error by clarifying what he thought defined a Jew. Jesus and his original apostles were all Jews. Most of Jesus' early followers were Jews. The early church began with Jewish origins. The problem was many Jews had forgotten the faith that their forefathers had demonstrated in following Yahweh. Matthew 23, verse 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithlessness, that you ought to have done, sorry, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. They follow the rituals without understanding or applying the internal truth represented in their rites. Paul argued that a true member of the covenant family was not someone who necessarily seemed to be a Jew outwardly. Neither appearance nor adherence to religious traditions marked the genuine Jew. Unfortunately, the Jews in the church at Rome had wrapped themselves in styles of worship, dietary habits, traditions, and especially the symbol of circumcision. They had missed the point. True circumcision went beyond a physical operation. It was not outward and physical. Even today, some people can reject an appearance that might cause observers who admire them as being the perfect Christian model, all the while being in disobedience. The Lord looks beyond the superficial surface and judges us on what lies beneath. Verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. In contrast to external or physical characterizations, Paul says that a true Jew is not merely someone who was born into a particular ethnic heritage or who has followed certain religious customs. A true Jew, a person that God's considered to be part of his people, demonstrates a circumcision of the heart. This shouldn't have been anything new to the Jews that knew the Old Testament. Moses had taught the nature of true circumcision is of the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. True circumcision proceeds from loving God with all of one's heart and soul. The verse says, Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Paul says that this kind of spiritual condition results from the work of the Holy Spirit rather than any effort of the flesh. It's achieved not by following just the letter of law, but allowing God to transform our heart. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. God will remove a heart of stone and replace it with one of flesh, pliant, under the hands of the Father. Someone whose heart has been changed by God's Spirit desires more than just meeting the minimum requirements of the letter of the law. This true Jew desires to please God by keeping his word with all his heart. Speaking of this person with a changed heart, the verse says, quote, His praise is not from man, but from God. Paul says that praise from people doesn't matter, only praise from God. Jesus warned about performing religious works in order to garner human praise. Remember the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 that proudly played God, I thank you, I am not like other men. Jesus taught his disciples to seek to serve God in a way that glorifies him, not to receive the praise of men. Matthew chapter 6 verse 18 says, That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. No greater praise is possible than to hear the Father say, well done. God looks beyond outward appearance. He knows actions that are mere lip service from those that come from a heart dedicated to him. Fortunately, we aren't limited by our puny self-efforts. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Through his Holy Spirit, God dwells in us to give us the desire 
in the empowerment to please him. Next week, we'll discuss lesson four. The main theme for that lesson is all who accept the gospel by faith are justified before the Father. The study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through chapter 4, verse 3. I'll remind you again that if you don't have a study guide and you want one, they're available at the church. I understand that there's at least one person there during normal business hours. I'd like to leave you in prayer. Heavenly Father, these are extremely troubling times. Besides all of the things we see or hear on the news that are disconcerting, perhaps the worst part is just the uncertainty. Because of that, we ask for peace in addition to your protection. Give us patience and kindness and empathy so that we can be good examples in our community. We especially ask for blessings on our church and its staff and Pastor David. We also ask that you bring us back together soon that we can worship together. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.